One of the biggest events in modern history is without a doubt the rise of counterculture. It has shaken and shaped the United States incredibly. It all started in the early 1960s, so I'd like you to picture yourself as a maturing teenager in that time period. The world around you is changing, and it's changing very quickly. The civil rights movement is in full swing, changing the course of history in front of you. Large topics are coming into light in a totally new way. Classical gender roles, women's rights, human sexuality, psychedelic drug use, etc. These topics threaten to shake the foundations of the average leave-it-to-beaver-style society, and you are beholding it. Much greater yet, the government is heading full force into yet another massive war. This is the world you will learn to live in. That was the 60s. In the early 60s, the United States ended the war in Vietnam. This practically drew a line in the sand between those who supported war and those who didn't. It was on this issue that the majority of the counterculture movement was based upon. Enormous war protests consisting of thousands of mostly younger people in every major U.S. city effectively united millions against the war. One of the largest anti-war protests to ever occur was staged by Vietnam Moratorium Committee on November 15, 1969. As many as half a million people attended a mostly peaceful demonstration in Washington, D.C. Here is a photo of the massive rally with the Washington Monument behind it. What a remarkable piece of history. The rally featured speeches by anti-war politicians including Eugene McCarthy, George McGovern, and Charles Goodell, the only Republican to take part. It also included musical performances by Peter, Paul, and Mary, Arlo Guthrie, and Pete Seeger, who led the crowd in the singing of John Lydon's Give Peace a Chance. Pete Seeger, in singing Give Peace a Chance, interspersed phrases like, Are you listening, Nixon? Are you listening, Agnew? Or are you listening, Pentagon? Between the choruses of protesters singing, All we are saying is give peace a chance. The New York Times described the crowd as predominantly youthful, and a mass gathering of the moderate and radical left, old-style liberals, communists and pacifists, and a sprinkling of the violent new left. This graph demonstrates the gradual downward trend of support for the Vietnam War. A new kind of people grew out of this culture preaching unity, peace, and openness. This group is commonly referred to as hippies. These people wore a different kind of dress, frequently experimented with hard drugs, lived in communities together, and developed a vibrant music scene. Much like the attempted utopias of the 1840s, over 2,000 new communes formed during this active era. These communities wholly rejected the capitalist ideologies of their predecessors, with many of these places rotating duties, making their own laws, and electing their own leaders. Some of the communes were philosophically based, but others were influenced by new religions. Earth-centered religions, astrological beliefs, and Eastern faiths proliferated across American campuses. Some scholars labeled this trend as the Third Great Awakening. Most communes, however, faced fates similar to their 19th century forebears. A charismatic leader would leave, or the funds would become exhausted, and the community would gradually become extinct. One such commune was known as Taylor Camp. This was a small settlement established in the spring of 1969 on the island of Kauai, Hawaii. At its peak, there were only 120 permanent residents. It began with only 13 hippies seeking refuge from the ongoing campus riots and police brutality in the United States. This commune was arrested for vagrancy, but fortunately, Howard Taylor, brother of the famous movie star Elizabeth Taylor, bailed them out, inviting them to settle on a beachfront he owned. The settlement was condemned in 1973, and residents, after losing legal battles, moved away over the years. There were only a few residents remaining in 1977 when the camp was attacked in a series of violent incidents. The site remains undeveloped. This excerpt from a documentary about Taylor Camp perfectly captures the idea of hippie communes in only two minutes. Camp was the ultimate hippie fantasy. Tree houses on the beach, living naked. Eating psychedelics. We were expanding our lives and our minds and our spirituality. We wanted to get away from that crazy war, those crazy cops. Yeah, we were uh, definitely into peace and love. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother. Everybody get together. Try to love one another right now. The 
like the name Taylor Camp because Taylor Camp is a little bit Taylor's brother. Yes, there was organization. We had a toilet, we had a cesspool, we had running water. There was a lot of sexual tension there. Uh, as far as the drugs, there was a ton of drugs in that place. It was full on anatomy 101 for a bunch of little kids. After, you know, learning about diseases coming around and stuff, I was getting real pissed off. I turn around and boom, right there. Boom. Twin barrels of a shotgun stuck right up against my screen window. People just did like Taylor Kemp. But I will admit that we certainly were willing to print things that were bad about him. Who knows where the time goes? Who knows where? One of the most noticeable and lasting changes that the counterculture movement made on society was its impact on the American diet. Uncommon f items foreign to U.S. grocery stores began to surface with the rise of the hippie movement. These were items such as wheat germ, yogurt, and granola. The popularity of vegetarianism and organic gardening both skyrocketed as well. Today we walk through grocery store aisles and we see granola nearly everywhere. This is thanks entirely to the counterculture movement. Another change this movement made on society was the effect it had on fashion. The beat poet Allen Ginsberg first coined the term flower power in 1965, claiming it was, quote, a means to transform war protests, protests into a peaceful, affirmative spectacle. The hippies adopted this symbolism almost instantly by wearing flowers in their hair, embroidering their clothing with flowers in vibrant colors, and distributing flowers to the public, becoming known as flower children. Long hair and afros became the norm for younger men, while, as previously stated, hippie women typically wore flowers in their hair. An especially odd trend popular among hippies was the celebration of what was generally regarded as peasant clothing. Beads, bell-bottom jeans, and tie-dye shirts also became the rage, as each person tried to celebrate his or her own sense of individuality. A large section of the hippie culture's sphere of influence pertains to music. Centered in the Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco, a new wave of psychedelic rock and roll became the music of choice. Bands like The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, and The Doors created new sounds with electrically enhanced guitars, subversive lyrics, and association with drugs. Folk music was fused with rock, embodied by the best-known solo artist of the decade, Bob Dylan. With Bob Dylan doing this, the popular Beatles went from their original sound of highly original, irresistibly catchy, early American rock and roll mixed with R&B, to psychedelic with their landmark album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which inevitably made counterculture counter music mainstream. Whether it be the war protests, communities developed, or the food, music, and fashion of this movement, one thing is certain. This movement has had a significant presence in the long course of United States history. Thank you.